I'm your host, Doreen Steenland, and today I'd like to welcome our guest, Dr. Rola Halam. Why don't we just dive right in and tell us a little bit about your passion behind um, this work of, of helping frontline workers manage, go from surviving to thriving? Mm. So I guess... I guess maybe I want to start with two years ago. It was the 10 year anniversary of the war in Syria. I was doing another BBC interview. We had just launched a second documentary and I had an out of body experience as I was speaking to the presenter and I suddenly was seeing myself and I just was like, suddenly was like, I can't believe I'm still doing this work. I can't believe I'm still talking about hospitals being bombed, about children being bombed, about schools being bombed. Mm. And I just knew that I just, I I couldn't go on anymore. Mm. That, the war was supposedly gonna be just a few few days or a few weeks. You know, I had no idea. None of us had any idea who were responding to it that was going to go on for so long. And I guess that day for me was when I really fell into this valley of of burnout and and what I later realized was actually trauma. Um, but I think in hindsight, I realized that actually I there'd been alarm bells ringing for quite a while, mm. but I just hadn't heard them I hadn't recognized them I was ignoring them it was a a, a cacophony of things and stuff and noises and um and I think it's partly why I'm now having come out of the other end and having gone through so much healing and now found my thriving self again that's why I feel so so moved so called um to be a light and support others through their darkness to and 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 let them know that there is that there is light at the end at the end of the tunnel and that they, they can go through the healing that they need to to come back to feeling alive purposeful and joyful again wow wow all right so you you said a lot of great things there but what i want to bring attention to right now is those alarm bells that you said that were going off that maybe you pushed aside. Can you describe that a little bit? So um, I hadn't realized until six months into my healing journey that I had been stuck in fight and flight for 10 years. Wow. Yeah. I think most of us, especially those of us who respond to emergencies as part of our speciality, and this is not just to do with war, right? This is, I'm an anesthetist and an intensive care medic, right? And so when I talk about trauma, I'm not actually just referring to Syria. Um, I'm sure any healthcare professional listening to me right now only has to pause. Mm -hmm. And like me, they will think of the 10 year old who died of anaphylaxis who you can bring back the 18 year old who you promised would be fine and they died at the end of your syringe. You know, the 30 year old who, who, who you did the spinal cord analysis on and to declare her dead before she, before she went for her um, organ her transplantations. And you know what I mean? Like there is, there are, there, there, there are so many incidences that happen throughout our lives as medical professionals. Mm-hmm. And we normalize so much stress. And so for me, that was, I was always frustrated. I was always in a rush. Nothing was fast enough. Nothing was soon enough. Everything seemed inadequate. I seemed inadequate. Um, My expectations of myself and of others were rising and rising and rising. Mm -hmm. Um, And um, I found myself angry, blamey, Mm -hmm. um, exhausted, but also towards the end, there was this sort of brain fog, this um, just inability to critically think. Um, I didn't have the clarity that I thought I that I once had. Um, and 
I had completely ignored some of the physical manifestations, which I just thought were completely unrelated. You know, my chronic back pain, I just thought was a completely unrelated issue. Um, my increasing headaches, my insomnia, my on off smoking, you know, I just hadn't put all of those things together until until that day, until that moment that just catalyzed that gigantic pause. Um, and then in hindsight, a lot of things started to come into focus. Wow. Okay. So let's take this one step further. When, mm. when you were living in this state, how did that translate to your home life? Well, I mean, what had led to that state was essentially working 24-7. Yeah. You know, I think that we live in a 24 seven culture and I think especially in the medical industry, we are expected to work 24 seven to always answer your emails, to answer your phone calls. And, you know, some of my clients talk about feeling guilty when they go on holiday because they feel like they can't step away from their emails and that they can't ignore emails or correspondences and messages that are coming in through from bosses or colleagues, even though they're meant to be away. Right. So we have this 24 um, seven culture. So I was working weekends, evenings, my holidays were medical missions. Um, there was really no such thing as work-life balance. It was just all work. Um, and that eventually actually led to the collapse of my first marriage. And, um, and in so many ways, the birth of my daughter was one of my biggest healing catalysts because um, it was when I finally realized I had to start putting boundaries around my time. And it was the first time in 10 years that I actually stopped working evenings and weekends and, and reclaimed back my holidays. Um, and so definitely thank God that um, she was sent to me to, to help catalyze that healing. Wow. Wow. And those so, boundaries. Most of, most of us just don't know that word, right? Like yes. that it's just not part of our vocabulary. Exactly. And so as medical professionals, many of us are um, hyper achievers. We're, we're, were um, very high achieving, high energy um, perfectionist mm -hmm. personalities. And for, mm -hmm. for those type of um, patterns, and I call them stress patterns because that's what mm -hmm. they are, right? There yeah. are ways of coping with, with uh, stuffing emotions, with pain that we don't want to address, with just keeping things going and boxing things up. So for these type of personalities, how can you shift their mind to get them to see that boundaries are important for them? Mm. I think there's several different things within what you just said. Um, I think first of all, what most of us don't realize is some of those patterns and personalities came as a result of childhood traumas. Yes um and and certainly and this doesn't have to be some big trauma it's not necessarily big t trauma but it could be tiny t trauma you know like your the fact that you only really got attention when you got an a in your exams and so you became that achiever and you started to prioritize achieving right and so um and so the first thing I would invite all of us is to to do that work of looking back and seeing like hmm where does that come from? And um, because the chances are within each one of us is an injured child who needs to be brought back into the fold and reintegrated. So that's the first thing that I would say. Um, um, on boundaries, what I really love is, um, is when I had the realization um, about how toxic the marathon mentality is, right? Like, so I don't know if this translates in the US, but like in the UK and in so many cultures, we say, you know, slow down. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Do you have that? Yes, we do. <laughs> right. Now, 
I just realized how I realized a couple of years ago how toxic that was because you know that is basically telling you to keep going no matter how struggling how desperate how exhausted bleeding nipples doesn't matter keep going right and and marathons by their very nature are loan sports right and so what I've come to realize is that it's it's not a marathon it's a relay you me are meant to run and run fast and when it's our turn to run as far as we go but then we hand over the baton and then we stop and we rest and we recharge and we train and we have we play and we have fun and we do we regenerate right not when we're broken not when we deserve it not when we've achieved but because it is part and parcel of a healthy way of being and then we get the baton again and we run and we run fast and we run as fast as as far as we go right and so when I work with clients I kind of say like that's the that's the mentality we need to all embody is becoming a relay racer so where do you need to draw where how where do you need to train in order to really make sure that you are going as efficiently as effectively as brilliantly as you want when it's your turn Mm -hmm. but how do you also make sure that you're drawing drawing these lines so that you are having that regenerative time. Wow, that is huge. Okay, that is right there, big mind sh- mindset shift. Mm-hmm. Um, because we are all about the marathon, especially right. here in the States, right? It's all about the marathon. And we keep saying these things to ourselves, and they're just sentences in our brain. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. we need to change those sentences a little bit. And I love that, yes. that picture of of the relay Mm -hmm. Um, because Because it's it's also about a team sport yes right the relay is a team sport we're not meant to run alone yes what we do in healthcare is is meant to be about a team and it means that I look after you when you're feeling down and you look after me when I'm feeling down and we are all looking after the patients and and the healthcare so it's moving it away from this like I must survive to like how can we all thrive? And that is with us working as a team. Wow. I, I love that because really that's how we want our brain to work also, mm. right? As an integrated whole and mm. connected to others, not mm. just a whole on our own, but a yes. whole and connected. And Dr. Daniel Siegel says, um, I think he says, we right? It's not about me. It's about we. It's about me Mm. and we together, Mm. right? Mm. And I think Mm. that that's a beautiful picture because we can't do it alone. We were not created to be alone. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think certainly of the clients I've worked with, the ones who have been the most resilient, who actually a little bit like me took the longest to burn out and crash and burn are the ones that had a strong support and a strong sense of community and and a lot of people around them. So it makes such an important difference to us staying resilient and then doing the healing as in when we do need to kind of take that, slow down that pause and 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 kind of call call it time out sometimes um in order to do that it makes a huge a huge difference it's my fundamental belief that we are meant to heal in community yes all right so good and it just what that made me think of is um a mistake that i see clients making often when when we try to tell people to slow down they then want to compartmentalize things and mm. shut them, shut certain parts of their life out. And mm. I've noticed that that causes this cognitive dissonance, right? It causes like a lot of problems internally when they say, all right, mm. I can't feel that emotion. I'm going to push it down, mm. right? I can't show emotion at work at all. So I'm just going to stuff it. And we're, what happens to that emotion is it lodges in your body right? As you said, you had back pain, right? And you just took it as probably normal signs of aging, which many Mm. of us do. Mm. And Mm. so when we don't really address our lives as a whole, individually and with others, this is the, these are the kind of compartmentalized um, boxes that, that develop inside us. 100%. 
Yeah. So, mm-hmm. so um, as you think of emotions in the workplace, mm. what, what are your thoughts about that? Why don't we just talk a little mm. bit about that? I, I love the subject because <laughs> it's probably one of the areas where I've done my biggest growth. Um, you know, I used to call myself Fortress Rilla you will only ever see me strong and powerful. I think as a result of some childhood things, as well as some bullying, um, my um, detection mechanism was that you will not see me vulnerable. Mm. And so I, like so many people, grew up thinking strong men and women don't cry. Um, and and actually, I think it, it took... And when, when the war in Syria started, I then I went through a period of time and I didn't realize that was one of the manifestations of trauma of really isolating myself. You know, to my mind was like, who wants to speak to someone who just feels rotten? Like I've got nothing good to say. I feel awful. You know, I, all I want to talk about is Syria and war and what's happening. And so I isolated myself and, um, and then that feels really lonely. And then, you know, and then you start to speak to your friends and then you realize like, duh, like, of course they want to know. Of course they want to hear about it, you know, good, bad and ugly. And so I've basically now dismantled the fortress and I've gone full suck of, you know, 180 degree on that and have finally, partly through the work of Brene Brown, but just partly through doing the work myself of realizing that actually, um, emotions hold such wisdom. Yes. Um, they tell me about my values. Um, they tell me about what matters to me. They tell me about my priorities. They tell me about um, when my boundaries have been, um, um, uh, you know, <laughs> in the Syria context, completely, you know, um, <laughs> shut all over. <laughs> you yeah. know, they, they, they actually um, hold so much wisdom and it is our judgment of ourselves and again this comes back to some of that patterns and being high achievers and a lot of these other you know um things of where we judge these things as negative Mm -hmm. and now now I love a good crying fest now I'm like (laughs) I've gone the opposite like I went from like (laughs) hardly ever crying to like if it needs to come out, I just let it out, you know, and, and in the workplace, I mean, partly why I'm doing the work that I'm doing and that I'm speaking about it is because I want to share that with people. Yes. And I want to tell people that there were days when I just sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. Yes. And there were days when I was just absolutely furious and a fury visited me and all I could do was just be angry mm-hmm. Um, there was just so much that needed to come out. And honestly, I cried a river and my my back pain was gone. Wow. None of the physio, none of the chiro, like none of that actually helped. It was the crying the river. It was letting out the emotions. It was letting out the sobs. It was facing the grief. It was facing so many of the stories and things that I had faced and letting them just come out that then actually released that energy for me to get energy back. Yeah, that's what creates space. It's what creates lightness, right? Is when you let the old out. Like most of us would never think of leaving our the f- memories on our phone to get full, right? Like because yeah. then you can't receive messages and you can't right. take any more photos, right? Whereas we do that all the time to ourselves. We run the battery low, we get our memories full, and then we wonder why we are like completely, you know, full up and exhausted. And it's because we we need to do that emptying. And that comes with um, what I call with my clients, becoming emotional alchemists, mm-hmm. like really facing and, 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 and acknowledging and being with those so my my so-called lead emotions you know anger sadness or whatever and either letting them go or transforming them into love transforming them into compassion transforming them you know even some forms of anger can be motivating um but most of it actually just ends up being this cancerous yes um paralyzing force and so it really is about how do we all turn those emotions into the gold and let them let them enrich our lives 
Wow, so much gold there, so much wisdom. Um, you know, it makes me think when we're holding on to those emotions and we're not, so emotions take just a few seconds to process, right? And when we mm. stuff them and don't process them, it's like holding our hand on a hot stove, right? Because we're feeling pain, but we're not allowing ourselves to just experience. It's like a wave. It's gone in a matter of two minutes. Mm. If we would just acknowledge it, mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. so Absolutely. Let's, let's just shift a little bit because I want to bring COVID into this conversation, if we could, for just mm. a few seconds and how COVID has changed um, our workforce. What, what are your thoughts mm. about that? <clears throat> My thoughts are that COVID came and highlighted mm much of what was either hidden from some or in plain sight but was being ignored. Mm -hmm. um, burnout was already high and on the rise with, with health professionals. Um, we knew that so many health systems were petering on the edge here in the UK. We've just had our first nurses strike ever in the history of the National Health Service. Um, um, you know, my colleagues describe warlike conditions as they try and, and, and um, you know, tackle another wave of COVID with the flu, with whatever. And so I think it came and highlighted what was already there, but it has traumatized pretty much everyone who was part of treating and managing COVID. Um, everybody in their own way, yeah. right? Yeah. And... And this is what I, this was part of my shock, if I can call it that, with medicine, when I finally realized that actually what I was labeling as burnout was actually trauma. Mm -hmm. And how little my medical training actually taught me about trauma, the signs and symptoms of it, let alone how to manage it. Mm -hmm. And so I find myself not only traumatized, but in an ocean of other deeply traumatized health professionals when we were all just treading water together, trying not to drown. And actually, I had to resort to a lot of other, you know, breath work, spiritual work, um, psychedelic work, a plethora of other nervous system, you know, uh, work in order to try and do that, some of that healing some of that healing needed, but I think that trauma is rampant and unrecognized and has been before COVID, but it has now shown the widened and shown the tip of the iceberg. And it's really now like just a huge alarm bell that I feel we all need to be heeding with immediate, with immediacy. I agree 100%. We are so on, on target here, um, but we are running out of time. So if you had to give one gold nugget for these people what's one tip you want to leave them about managing their internal landscape the one thing that actually catalyzed my healing actually cracked me wide open was developing self-compassion mm. For so long, my inner voice was any time that I would want to go anywhere near my own pain, there would be a nasty voice. I'd be like, shut that F up. This is not about you. Your, it wasn't your daughter who was raped, your son who was killed. It wasn't your house who was bombed. You're, you're here to help. So you shut up and you get on with your work, you know. And I didn't realize that that voice of shame is trauma. And so to anyone here who has that voice, please know that this is one of the hidden signs of trauma and please seek help. And, and it was developing self-compassion when I finally was able to say to myself, and you, and you have witnessed and suffered so much that it really just cracked my heart open and it enabled me to finally start to deal with my own pain, with my own suffering, with my own emotions. And I have a fundamental belief that until we are all self-compassionate, we cannot be fully compassionate with others. Wow. 
And so start there, be kind to yourself, be gentle with yourself, become your own best friend. And if you struggle with that, as we, as so many of us do, then ask for help, whether from me or from somebody else who has walked that line. Because honestly, for me, realizing that it all started with me and that I needed to put the oxygen mask on myself first before I could help anybody else was so profound in making me realize, okay, until I am healed, my only job is to heal myself and then I can continue to be a healing presence in the world. And until such time, I am no good to anybody else. Wow, that is beautiful. Dr. Rola, thank you so much for being with us today. 